to another episode of Executive Breakthroughs. I have a very exciting guest here, Becky Powell Schwartz, and she is going to lay a lot of insight on her career, her transitions, and a lot of other things on leadership and building teams and so much wonderful information. You're going to love it. So thanks for coming on the show today. I'm excited. It's great to see you. It's I'm great to see you too. And again. excited to see your journey and all yeah. the success that you've had. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I'd love to start to talk about, you know, where you grew up and okay. a little bit about your family and just to find out about your entrepreneurial journey, because I okay. like to talk about people's story arcs, so mm -hmm. people understand where they came from, then a lot of it makes a lot more mm -hmm. sense when we talk about what you're doing in your career. So I grew up in Indianapolis, and I'm the oldest, and um, both of my, uh, my parents were older in terms of uh, my dad was in his middle 30s. Uh, my brother and I were adopted, so when I was growing up, okay. my parents were a lot older than my my friends. But now they would be what contemporary. What did you get adopted at? I was adopted uh, at birth. At birth, but okay. they were older. I mean, you Got know, it. back then, you know, we don't want to say when, but back then, uh, it was yes. a little bit different. And so, growing up, um, I had a lot of uh, great things around me physically, but emotionally, it was very difficult. Uh, my brother had a lot of uh, emotional uh, challenges, drugs, alcohol, from a very early age. And so I had to learn to be pretty independent and to take care of myself emotionally. And so that is kind of one of my bedrocks and one of the foundations for me that's helped me, I think, be successful in a business. Um, my, um, my father, interesting enough, uh, was a corporate executive and at age 50, um, decided that he was going to leave the corporate world and he was going to start commercial and residential real estate. And so he did that for 25 years until he died. That was his second career. Why did he decide to quit corporate America? I don't know. I just was little. I was like six or seven, you know, and so... That's I'm, pretty fascinating to think because usually people just don't get up and quit a job right. and start something else like that at that right. age, just out of the blue. Right. I don't know. I, I, was, blue, I was young. Uh, I do know that while he was um, doing his corporate job, he was with Farm Bureau Co-op, uh, he was also building houses with my uncle. So he was always okay, doing so two he, things. So he was always, he was his always father was a salesman. He was always entrepreneurial. So, yes. And, yes. And he probably got that from a salesman from his dad. So he right. was always doing sort of multiple things. things. Exactly. Always doing kind of multiple things. So he was pretty things. busy then, it must have been, when you were growing yes. up. I mean, it was... He, was it hard for him to be present or be yes, at home? Yes, that was kind of part of the challenge. And so, you know, when you think about it, I was just asking the CEOs that I worked with, I said, well, when you were growing up, when you were an adolescent, who was the most, like, influential to you as a leader? And it was a really interesting exercise because then I had to think about it myself. And what I realized was is that there were different people, but it wasn't anybody really in my family because my, my dad, I was inspired that he was so busy and but but, but he wasn't around but he wasn't really around what I was, about your mom my mom was around kind of but she was not a real happy person so there was a lot of conflict in our family with my brother my mother was uh, a, was the club champion as a golfer uh, she was a she was a oil painter she was kind of a kind of a you know renaissance woman in her own kind of right but a lot of uh, not a real happy person and so my opportunity was to either kind of dig in or dig out. And so my, my, I just dug out. Well, why do you think at that point, reflecting back, that you decided to dig out or step away or do your own thing? Because a lot of people don't, right? Right. They implode or something else happens in their life. So, you know, I learned early on that my faith was really my tether. And so I prayed a lot, and I just said, you know, i got to figure out a way to have, not get stuck in all. It was very negative. It was very challenging. It was not a happy place. Hey, I'm a kid. I want to be happy. I want to live my Where did you find friends. your refuge then? Did my you find friends, school friends? My school? friends, my church. Not okay. really school. I was okay. an okay student. Okay. You know, looking back now, I had a, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of noise going on, so I wasn't really focused. You know, I wasn't like in clubs, you know, I didn't do that stuff, I was working. So my way to get out was to work, either to babysit, you know, um, my, 
you know, to take swim lessons. You know, I was introduced to the YMCA when I was in ninth grade as a, through my French teacher. And so volunteering, which got me into all this work at the Y, you know, I was all through high school and college, you know, I was doing lifeguarding, I coached the swim teams, I did swim lessons, and I always had a second job. I did not. So you're kind of like your dad, you followed like a multiple path. I followed because I wanted to get out of the house. I wanted you to wanted get, do something else. I wanted to do something else. I wanted and not to get be around in a negative environment. So how did being adopted, I guess, affect you? Because it's in, interesting as you talk to people who, who had that experience. Uh -huh. You know, some people just, they rolled through life. Some people it's affected them in many different ways. Right. Um, they've had to come to a lot of different realizations. Some people went back and tried to find their birth parents. Yep. So how did all that sort of... So early on, my parents said, you know, when before you go, you know, to school, you know, you were, they tell you you're adopted, that you were, you know, that you were chosen, right? You weren't had, you were chosen. I, I took the high road. My brother, for his entire life, could not deal with it. So we have two people exactly in the same family, right? One who really was challenged by it, one who said, let's, let's just kind of take it. So I, that was me. And so I just kind of took the high road and I said, okay, I'm chosen. I used to, you know, talk about it kind of, blow. oh, I'm chosen, I'm chosen, right? And so um, probably when I was about in my preteens, I wondered who my parents were. And I said, by the time I'm 60, I'm going to drive, I'm going to go to the hospital, get my birth certificate, I'm going to figure it out. Well, then I became like 19, and I'm like, oh, like all these years have gone by, and I really thought about it again. And so for me, it only became important from a health reason, because I wanted to know kind of what, what you know, did I have any health risk? And sure. so probably not till I was in my 40s did I actually track down my birth mother and uh, Indiana was as closed a state as Texas was open because I I was in Texas by then and so through actually one of my golfing buddies I found an organization that helped me kind of open Got the door it. so I was able to connect not not physically with my mother but through a, uh, a court appointed and so I found out all the information that I wanted to know and so for me and if you can imagine you grew up in a home where you're a little bit disconnected from your parents. You have a little bit of hole, right? And some yeah. that also leads to a lack of confidence. And as a leader, you've got to be confident, right? Sometimes they say you got to fake it till you make it. Yes. Right. Right. To get the evidence. To get the yeah. To get the, for yourself. Yes. Right. And so for me, that was like closing the loop. That was like that little hole that I had, or maybe the big hole. It closed. And the mystery so, was over. The mystery was over. I had the facts that I needed. I chose not to move forward uh, in, in really meeting her because uh, her family didn't know about it. Uh, her husband didn't know about it. Her children didn't know about it. Only her mother knew. Oh, wow. And so it was like, you know, here I'm, and she was a, you know, she was a janitor in a, in a small town in, in, in Indiana. She's watching Jeopardy or whatever. They get a call. Oh, by the way, are, did you have this child? And you know, da da da. You know, and you can just imagine yes. the the challenge that would the rock. unrest and the problems that might cause. Right. From so this. I feel like I had a lot of grace that that was a, a that the parents that I had, even though there were challenges, that yes. that was an opportunity for me. So, which is kind of how I look at life anyway. I try to say everything is a is an opportunity to learn. So when growing up, not having that loop closed, was that a confidence issue? Yeah, a confidence you? issue. And I find that... And how did, you over, how did you overcome that? Because I think one of the things that yeah. there's a the confidence conundrum loop for people... Yes, it can. It, yes, it can. It, it ...is because we don't have confidence because right. we don't have the evidence and the competency, mm -hmm. right, of right. knowing it. Well, it's right. a chicken and egg because the only way to get competency is then to take leaps of faith in order to get that That's right. evidence to be more confident. So, so two you... things. Number one, I always had a lot of people who believed in me probably more than I believed in myself. That's an important thing to be around really? people. Really, yes. That, that, that have that belief yeah. and that strong optimism yeah. in you. They saw a lot. I did have one aunt, but mostly my friend that I grew up with who I'm still friends with. I mean, she was a safe haven for me and she still, to this day, I mean, we've been friends since we've been like nine. You know, she lived wow. in Florida, and then my one of my college sorority roommates, uh, who would say, "Okay, here we go again. You're going to get me involved in something. You know that I'm going with you to try this, and I've never done it before, but I'm going with you, and you're still doing that. You know, 
And so those people, I had a, I had, um, I've had several people in my life who've been, who believed in me. You know, when I started the business, my boss, who was a CMO at that point, she said, you know, we've got your position open in Houston. Are you going to come or you're not? I said, I just don't think I'm going to come. What are you going to do? I don't know. But I'm not, I'm done. I'm done with the corporate stuff. She goes, you're going to start a business and we're going to be your first client. That was in 1988. And so she always believed in me far more than I ever believed in myself. And then, of course, then it, you know, then it, then it takes over. So then you have the evidence and you believe. But I also put myself in a lot of new situations. So I put myself in uncomfortable situations. I, I'm kind of courageous in that way. Even though my, I'd be afraid to do, do it, I do it anyway. Because that's how you build confidence. You know, starting this third career and you know, working, you know, building CEO groups, you know, I've been working with CEOs since 1981, but going out is a whole different... But now a different capacity. It's a whole different capacity. So what did you yeah. do in college? So you went to college, where did you so go So I went to Ball State University, which okay. is David Letterman's alma yeah. mater, okay? He, I went to he, Indiana University for undergrad, so I know. In Bloomington? Uh, yeah, in Bloomington. You did? Yeah. I didn't realize. Are you yeah. from Indiana? Chicago. Oh, Chicago, okay. So I, I started, I was going to be a physical therapist. Uh, that's what I always wanted to do but I could not hack the science, all that. Uh, and so I took all the tests and they figured that social work, so I was in one of the very first classes that had a Bachelor of Social Work. So I was gonna save the world. And so I stayed in Muncie, which is where Ball State is yes. uh, based. And I was a school social worker and I worked with a learning disability and emotionally disturbed, uh, I was kind of a, like a unit. And I worked with a teenage mothers and so my first husband was an architect, and so when we decided to leave, you know, he was come to Texas because Dallas was booming at that point. So when I came to Dallas, I um, waited tables, which was one of my other jobs that I did all through college, and um, I had a chance to go to work for the YWCA, and I was a program director, which was basically a marketing director. I was in charge of the operations of the building, which means I needed to know how to work the pool, the lights, talk to the um, groundskeeper who was Hispanic, who I came from. I didn't know how to speak Spanish, but, but we made it. And then I started a program for teenage mothers there. So I've always been kind of a fire starter, I guess you could say. So I created that program, it was junior league funded. Uh, and uh, that program, and up until a few years ago, was still in BISD. But in that role, what I found was that as a helping profession, not that great. I was more of a, you know, I needed to know what the goal was, the objective, you know, I wanted to have performance, I wanted to have accountability. You can't always do that when you're working, you know, with, uh, you know, in that social worker. So that's kind of how I started. I, um, so, so where'd you go from, how'd you pivot so, from that? Yeah, so, so what happened was, is this is kind of interesting, so, I was kind of um, challenged with the not accountability, no bottom line performance. And so I just started talking to people and I connected with a lady through my sorority alumni and her husband was the owner of what was then the Dallas Fort Worth Business Journal. Okay. So I went there as a marketing director. I had no clue really what was marketing. I didn't really know what that was, right? Uh, I was the only non-family member. Oh, wow. Yes. It was a great experience. I stayed there all of three months. I came and told my husband, I can't do this. Of course, we had school loans and all that stuff. I'm quitting my job. <laughs> wow. I'm quitting my job. I'm going to go wait tables, and I'm going to figure it out. And I'm going to also, I'm going to start a business. So I quit. I went to wait tables, and I started a consulting business where I went to nonprofits and sold them marketing plans. So how did you just go and, I know you said you just quit and figured this, yeah. but, and you just did this? I mean, did, yeah. did you talk to people about this and figure this out? Or you no, just, I just did it. You just kind of did it. I just said, I'm doing this. So how do you learn how to take that leap like that? Because that's something that people have a really big problem with. You know, mm -hmm. and I've read this thing about uh, five-second rule where, you know, if you, right. if you decide in five seconds or not, that's yeah. the difference. Mm -hmm. So how do you make the conscious decision to keep making a leap of faith? Because that's a pretty aggressive leap of faith to go say, I'm going to start a business and figure it out and just do it. So now most people who know me would say that I probably did a lot of research because most people who know me think I, I've done a lot of 
you know, I've done a lot of research. So I might not have done like traditional, but in my head, I'm kind of figuring, I'm already doing this and figuring out something while I'm going, right? So maybe if I'm going to leave or whatever, or maybe I could do this. And then I had these supporters who'd say, I think you should go do this. So it wasn't just me. It was people saying, I think you could do this. And like, well, what, is that like? what does that look like? So it was a combination of yes. you having the capacity to do this, probably having done it in the past, and also right. building a support group around. Because I think that's one thing it's a lot of times people cool. have a really, they don't have the right support people around them. Yeah, I had a lot of cheerleaders. I'm like, I've always had a lot of cheer, a lot of, a lot of cheerleaders. And I hope that I do the same for other people. Um, but I also have people who say, hoo hoo, blind spot, you can't see this. Those people I really listen to. Right, that's the, that's a critical thing about really critical. about having people that are telling you the truth. Right, and able to see your own blind spots and point them out because it, that means you've developed a relationship with them where they can communicate that with you. And that's because what again, I love. It's what pretty I do. rare. That's, that's not really. That's pretty rare. Most people have to find those things. Yeah, inside of other groups of yes. people that they have to join. It's not necessarily their friends or right. people around them are giving them that level of insight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just I have people who've been and they've all worked, so they all have great. They all have different kinds of experiences, and so some of us have been entrepreneurs, some have been corporate people. I mean, it's just they have really different, you know, experiences. So I um, so, yeah, I don't know. I guess my faith. I mean, it's kind of like it, I'm kind of like I jump even though I'm scared. I do it anyway. You know, I don't let that fear. You know, I jumped out of an airplane. I mean, I skydived. So, you know, I guess, and I'm a person who didn't like the heights and I didn't like airplanes. Do you think there's something in how you build your relationships that creates that in a way where people reciprocate that back or give it to you? Meaning the support and also the yes. telling you the truth because that, again, right. that's that there must be something you're doing in order to facilitate that mm-hmm. because that's just not a normal thing. I think most people would get that as much as you're getting from other people mm-hmm. around them. It's a give and take. It's, yeah. You can't just be a, you know, I don't, I'm not a taker. I'm a giver. I mean, that's one of the one things I love. I always want to say, how can I help you? You know, and so, and I've had relationships where people did take, so I moved on. Yes. I moved on. It's not, I moved on. And so that's part of a friendship to me, but I want, I'm going to be direct with you. You're going to be direct with me. I don't want window dressing. I don't want to put lipstick on a pig. You know, I want you to be direct. That's the best kind of friend that you can be is to tell me something I don't want to hear. And sometimes, you know, there's a lot of stuff we don't want to hear. Yes. So a lot of stuff we don't want well, to hear. Well, I think the important point is to be direct with people. Right. Tell them the things they don't want to hear, obviously, in a way that's tactful and respectful. Right. Um, well, sometimes not. <laughs> well, sometimes not, though. I guess sometimes, sometimes you just it have depends to say, on the person. That's true. Sometimes really you just depends. have to It really depends. I mean, I have... CEOs that I work with and I could be, but some people are just going to knock over the head. Sometimes I'm that way too. I always say the way that I learned is that I don't just kind of lightly put my hands on the stove. I singe my hands, you know, that's how my attention. So interesting. So then you started this business. So I started this business. So the goal was I was going to wait tables and I was going to try to figure out what I was going to do when I grew up. And then I was also going to have this little side business. And so I made a goal of every week that I had a certain number of touch points and I had to have at least 10 interviews a week while I'm doing all this other stuff, right? Got and it. I made a list of about 20 different careers that I thought I want. Do I want to go to law school? Do I want to be in the hospitality industry? Do I want to be in the advertising and PR? And so my plan was I would go and I would just start asking people, do you know somebody here? Do you know somebody here? Every person I met with, I would get two more people and I built this huge, big list. And through that, I figured out that probably the best place for me was advertising and public relations because I was kind of doing it. So I sent out these direct mailers. (laughs) So, and I got to the yellow pages, which I know it sounds like I'm 100 years old. And I just took advertising and I just sent out a whole bunch and I left to go on a holiday on Christmas vacation. And I come back and I get a call from a lady who literally her office is maybe a mile from where we live, like literally down the road. She was the PR maven of Dallas. I went to talk to her. I worked with her three days a week and I had my own business two days a week. Her name was Frida Gale Stern. She was, and um, still is, I, just, I learned so much from her. Um, and, and you sent her a direct mail piece? I sent, I sent all, I just all these people, advertising Go. firms, yeah, I just sent, I just sent these people and then I would just start following up and she called me and she called me, she says, I'm not really sure what you do. <laughs> 
maybe wasn't real clear on that. I wasn't real sure, but I had this, you know, I need somebody who can help me, you know, write releases, whatever. And I'm, I said, okay, I'll, I'll come down. We had this little office. Maybe. And she just said do it a few days a week, and you made an agreement that you could do your own I thing? Worked, yeah, I did two days of my own clients in three okay. days, and I did that for, I was with her for three years, and I eventually transitioned out of my own clients and went with her. And so I learned a lot. We worked on a lot of, you know, we, we opened, uh, we were a lot in the hospitality and real estate, so we did okay. a lot of that. And then I had a chance to go to work uh, at a Division of Federated, which now is known as Macy's, but it used to be Sanger Harrison and Foley's. And so I went to become the, their events director. So I was in charge of every car giveaway, store opening, cosmetic, fashion show, whatever. And I had like six or seven people who reported to me. So that was really my first and only kind of corporate job. So I was there for eight years and I did that for a few years and then all the eastern stores were moving into the marketplace and so that's when we had to you know multiple media outlets and the traditional media was important and we were kind of getting beat up and we had all of our competitors in there talking about you know all the great things and I said to the president we need to be out there talking to people talking to women's wear talking to no 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 we don't do that we need to do that the next thing I know oh, they've created a position and I'm not director of public relations and I'm a spokesperson and I do corporate contributions and so I did that for about eight years. Um, so they created this position because you told them there was a need and obviously yeah. you must have reached someone who said I agree with you. No, the president. So I so I dealt with directly with the president and the, and the CEO. And How did uh, you sway them because that's a lot of influence to create a position that doesn't exist. I mean that's a that's a hard thing to do in a company to get them to do it. I didn't try to, actually, I, I, I took all my friends who, and I said, these, these are the people who could, you know, these are the people who you should hire. I didn't think it was gonna be me. I just said, we should do this. And probably there was another conversation, I'm not sure it was all of me, but I think probably my boss, who was, at that point, was also very visionary, realized the need, you know, for this. And so, um, I pranced all my friends in, you know, and, they, and that the president said, why aren't, why don't you take this job? I'm like, well, I'm not a really good writer. I wasn't trained. We don't care. We'll get you a writer. You're really great at X. We're going to get you to do this. So that's what I did. And then I was on the merger team when we merged. So that was my first merger, you know. So that was quite interesting and exciting. And that's where I got my experience, really, in doing crisis communication. My, literally, my first day on the job, I got a call from the president. Oh, we have a really famous doctor in Fort Worth. Just shot in the parking lot of Fort Worth. We need wow. to go over there. This is no internet, no car phone. So right, it's you just know, live interviews and people coming or, or yeah, media. Coming and what in. do I do? I don't know. So you can see, I've learned a lot on the job. I mean, really, a lot of my I'm blessed with really great instinct, you know, and try to do a lot of research to try to, you know, I'm just not out there. So like what do you say to the people that try to get it perfect? Because a lot of people, mm -hmm. the reason they don't they uh, don't take action, right? is because they feel like they have to have it all right. figured out, right? right? And right. I'd love to see your perspective on that, also on the perspective of the people that you work for on having imperfect action that yeah. you iterated and got better over time. Right. Because a lot of people are worried about that yes. too, as well, being judged that, okay, if I don't have a perfect, right. my boss or other people will look on down on me because I failed right. at some point or not done it 100%. That. Oh, that was always, uh, you know, some people are, I'm always motivated by fear. So I was motivated that, well, I don't know, what. how do I do this? I don't really know how to do this. I had a lot of people I'd call this, this, how do you do this, how do you do this? You know, I'd ask and then I would go about doing it and then I would see I would get, you know, six So you also seven. build up a network of people, people. that you could yes. call. Right. And get advice from, bounce ideas yes. off from. Right. So that's also really important for yes. people to be a part of groups, have mentors, coaches, I've support all groups that. all along I've, I've in order to do that. I've always done that. But I hope yeah. you facilitate learning and also your career significantly right. faster because, you know, it's one thing to say that you're in front of a bunch of people in crisis management, but if you've got to figure out also, like, what to do. And that's hard to do. Just well, I remember your... that. I remember that first one because I was like, the good thing was we didn't have a phone where I had to be talking. So I had like 45 minutes of quiet that I could actually figure out what I was going to do when I got over there. And so I thought, well, my job is to protect 
the brand and the reputation of my organization right. while being authentic. So how do I do that? Nobody told me that. I mean, I just it's just in my DNA, right? That's and just so, that's just who you were and have who. been since you've been a little kid. Yeah, all the exactly. Way, all right, way. right. And so when I thought, what if we can get the police department to talk first, let them, because they have the facts, and then we can have some kind of comment over here. And so that's what I did. <laughs> so that is a strategy, right? When you have some yes. type of situation where you have law enforcement, you want to be able, on a crisis situation, to have them talk first. And right. then you're just real, like, we're sorry. I mean, you know. So it's that's how partly is that how I learned is just you know just like raw talent I guess just out there figuring it out and I watched a lot you know I had in Dallas we had an amazing group of women called Women in Communication and these women have gone off to be great leaders in communication and marketing that was a group where I could go we helped each other you know like somebody was in this sector some in this sector so we could go and say hey how do we do this. So that was a really important group for me. You know, I had different people that I had. There was a uh, there was the number one radio brand in Dallas for 25 years, a, a man by the name of Ron Chapman. He became, gosh, I worked with him early on, and I could go to him and, you know, ask him, you know, what to do. So I just had some great people that I aligned with. I had the, you know, the... Um, publisher of the Dallas Weekly still, Jim Washington. You know, he was a great, uh, he's African American leader, uh, and he was really instrumental in an initiative that, that I led with uh, the Dallas Museum of Natural History called Ramses the Great. It's the largest Egyptian exhibit ever held in the United States. That was a pretty much a $10 million business that we created from nothing. And that part of that, a million dollars of that is part of the seed money for the Perot. So that whole kind of... So what do you talk to people that... So the perfect thing, I'm sorry to yes, answer that. No, no, no. So the perfect thing is this. that I always felt like I was trying to be perfect. But I realized that, at, that you have to make, you can't, you will miss opportunities, which I had missed opportunities if I did not respond. And you've got to go with the 80-20. Yes. And that's what you've got to realize. But you don't know that, and some of us are you know, wired differently. You know, some people really need perfection, but you cannot lead and be perfectionist. There's really certain, important. you can pick where are, you know, you have to be focused and you've got to pick certain things that are the most important. And then there are certain things that you just have to let go. And that's a really hard thing for, I think, because a lot of the leaders that I meet now are a lot in the control. You know, I use Predictive Index. I don't know if you know that tool, but it's an amazing tool. It's been around since the late 50s. It's an assessment tool. And so I profile all, I use it in my own company. And so you, you see kind of what their natural behaviors are, right? So a lot of these leaders, I mean, they have gotten to be successful because of that control, right? Yes. And the trust. And so then we get to Tubby's like, you know, trust. And that's at the core of culture. That's at the oh, core yes. of relationships. You know, is trust is the really fabric. important. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And underlying that is caring is the key. Yes, well, that's kind of they kind of come yeah. right hand in hand. Hand in hand. So, so what about this now? You know, one of the interesting things is you built all these relationships, and one of the things that I find is entrepreneurs mm -hmm. are much better at it than people in corporate America. Yes, right. And I run across a lot of senior leaders saying, "Well, you know, I'll build relationships later." Whether they say it or whether it's in their actions, mm -hmm. right? But what would you say to those people uh, who are not doing that right now to encourage them or also maybe use fear as a motivator? Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me having those relationships allowed you to take those leaps of faith mm -hmm. and have a lot more confidence and evidence that you could do them because of the people that you had around you. Mm -hmm. And without that, that probably would have hindered your ability to either do that or be successful at it, either one. Well, I think in corporations, at least now, and my sister was a corporate executive for many years and she really isolated. They're so busy, right? They're so busy. They're not, they're not joining as many organizations. If you look at organizations like American Marketing Association, PRSA, all those that we used to have a lot of people go to lunch, people don't even go and do that anymore, right? 
So it's not in the, so part of it is they come to it honestly because they don't have a lot of extra time. So where are they gonna reach out and get those extra relationships, right? If it's not in the work environment. They could get it at church, they could get it at their neighbors, they could get it in their college alumni groups, you know, they can get it on the golf course. There's lots of different places that you get it, but you have to put effort into it. And make so it a priority. It takes a lot, yeah, it takes a lot of effort. I was really blessed because I was divorced for 22 years. And so I had this, enormous bandwidth that I could go out and I was only limited by my energy which I have a lot of and so still and so the thing is is that that was a gift that that I had that was a gift that I was able to make those relationships I've now been married for 11 years and so what I know is is that and is that I have kids and family and all that stuff that I didn't really have before is that it takes, that takes time away. So as a leader in a company, right, and I see the leaders that I work with, you have limited time, so how are you gonna spend that time? And if you're today working a lot, you wanna spend it hopefully with your family, right? Yes. That's the first place, right? You wanna spend it with your family, and then where does it go? So I think you do have to make a conscious decision to say, you know, like, well, what, how could I be better? What could I learn, right? What can I learn? How can I be better if I have these kind of relationships? And maybe these relationships don't look exactly like me. Yes. Right? Maybe they're different. Important. Right? Maybe maybe they're different. And so how does that stretch me? And so who is going to push on that? Is the organization push you to get out through that or you do it yourself? So you have to want to do it. I think it's interesting because one of the things that you did early on is you had to leave the house to meet people. Yeah, I did, right. And yeah. so it's yeah, probably, good, good, good. Uh, yeah, it's I interesting, that. Yeah, you know, exactly. that you were forced to do it, so then it became habitual, mm -hmm. and now as I see, we're talking about this along your story arc and path, I didn't, that's right? Brilliant. I didn't even think so about that, So it's funny right. that sometimes inside of tragedy, yes. inside of all this hardship that was going on, right. Great things happen. Great things happen, and actually some of the strength that you have and greatness that you have now and mastery yeah. actually came out of that really yeah. tough family environment that forced you to do these things early right. on. And of course, then you didn't really understand right. it, but you did it as a habit, so now you're doing it all right. that went wrong. So one of the other interesting things that kind of, when I listen to here, you say this. So when I, so my mother died when I was 21, so I'd just been divorced, um, I'd just been married just uh, a few months. My dad then died a few years later, and I literally two months after I got divorced. So I found myself kind of by myself because my brother was still having those kind of challenges. So I decided, hey, I'm going to create my own family. So I have my heart family. So to your point, I went out and created my own family. So I have a heart family. What's a heart family? So a heart family are people that you know uh, are you're connected with your heart. So I have two mamas, one who just turned 100 and one who's 85, and I have five heart sisters. And how did you do this, and how did you think about this? What <laughs> You just made it up. I just decided, I want my own family. And so I was single. I was like, I don't know. I don't that is such a great thing. I, I mean, it's funny. I don't even, I've never heard anyone say, I'm just going to create my own family. Because we, <laughs> we people talk about that. You're born with your family, and you choose yeah, your friends. That's right. It's the same kind of but, thing. Right, but the difference is, is yeah. then you said, okay, I have, the, that's true, but right. now I'm right. going to change the meaning of family, right? Right, yeah. People have told me what it meant, society yeah. has, but now I'm going to change it and right. I'm going to create what I want right. and right. build it out. That's interesting. And those women have been their, and their husbands have, those, that has been my family. Those have been my biggest cheerleaders. And then my husband is my huge cheerleader for me support. You know, when I decided to change my business and I was going to go uh, do Vistage and, you know, start these CEO groups and do executive coaching and all this stuff, I mean, it was hard. It was hard, harder than starting my business. And boy, my husband was the, uh, the and those women and my mama still. My mama, you, just, you know, will support. say, you know, she's a she just turned 103 weeks ago, and she'll say, "Why oh, are you in your groups? You know, like where are you? Who are you contacting?" She's 100 years old. She's my biggest cheerleader. So the other, I guess the other message of that is that when you think about mentoring and you think about yes. your responsibility, right, in, in life, is that I feel like I had a gift that maybe my mother didn't mentor me, maybe I didn't have it, but then I got two women 
that have loved me, who've given me confidence, who are my biggest cheerleader. So it's my responsibility also to pass that on, which I've done in my in my life. You know, so it's a just it's a it's you know it's amazing. So. That's fantastic. Yeah. So now we get out of your days at Macy's, and what happened uh -huh. after that? What's the next? So then I started the PAL group. So I started the PAL group in 1989. My goal was to go in and really make a difference. And that was make a difference in helping them in terms of building awareness about their products or services. You know, what did that look like? Primarily using public, traditional public relations tools. And so I started and I um, learned probably early on is that I needed a team because I wasn't too good by myself. So I got a great lady who came in and she wrote for me part time and she kind of helped keep me organized. And so I mostly worked on local accounts. And then in my fourth year, I had my first national account, which was 7-Eleven, and then just kind of took off. So the goal was that we were in, we worked primarily with industry leaders in retail and manufacturing. So people like Starbucks, Blockbuster, 7-Eleven, you know, um, Overhead Door, Hanson, those kind of people. Um, that that's the path that, that we would Got take. It. So I grew the agency. I had this network of 50 uh, uh, firms across the country. So we, as people would say, we play big. So I always work with industry leaders and really helping them from either brand awareness and traditional kind of promotions PR or in brand asset or asset protection from the crisis side. So that's really my passion. That's what, really. what was the, what was, you'd say, your biggest uh, mistake or learning lesson it, during it's, that time? During that time of growing the Powell Group and through the whole uh, Well, two today. things. Yeah. Number one was the confidence thing, was to really have confidence in myself because as a leader, you've got to be visionary. You've got to have a vision and you've got to trust your vision even if no one else trusts it, right? So great leaders have a vision and there's a lot of noise and sometimes there's, oh, no, that's not going to happen. And so I missed the social media mark. That was my big mistake. So I... I could see it coming, and I was like, "We got to do it." And I had a, a, a my my VP, who I had a lot of confidence in, who's you know younger than me, said, "I oh, know that's that's not a big deal. It's not gonna happen." So I said, "Okay, fine. Okay, all right. We'll just keep doing it." That was my big mistake. I missed it. I missed it. And do you think that you because you didn't obviously have the confidence, but yeah. then what about that person too? Is that did that also? I'm just wondering about either coaching them or hiring. Do you feel like? Maybe that person, in retrospect, wasn't the right person for the. Or, no, she was the right person. Okay. She was. She was with me for thirteen years. She now has her own agency. Um, she was. Uh, I thought she was going to be the successor. You know, uh, it didn't work out. She went to work with a client, Got which it. we kept, and then she left that client and started her own. So she has a very successful marketing um, business. So I'm really proud of. Uh, I'm really proud of what she's accomplished. So no, I just think it was the timing. You know, and I could have, we could have like hurried up and kind of gone on it, but it was, it was just, they're always, you know, I had a business consultant who used to say, there's some things that have to have an end. And I said, oh, that's not true. No, no, things do have to have an end. So it's the right thing. The right so thing. Uh, now we get to the end of Powell Group, or uh -huh. where you're at right now. Yeah. Why don't you just tell people where are you at now with yes. all these different things that you're working on? So what happened was is that in the 20 plus years that I had the business, I had several times to offer to, 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 buy, uh, to sell. And I was having a lot of fun and I didn't want to sell, okay? And so the purpose of building the business is obviously to have a great asset at the end, right? And so um, sometimes we lose sight of that because we're having a good time, yes. right? And so, and timing is everything. And so when it came time, the last time, which was in 2012, um, I had a chance to sell and I spent a lot of due diligence on it and I decided, uh, number one, I had never got hit by any recession where rock and roll, I got hit like everybody else did. So my financials were not great. So my numbers, I wasn't going to really be able to sell for what I felt was worth, you know, yes, I was going to get a lot of money, but n not as much based on the effort that I was going to have sure. to put on. It was a great pivotal point for me. Because what I realized was I'm tired of this business. I'm tired of talent piece. I'm tired of the really what is my, what's my love? Well, my love is really helping companies and really working with senior leaders and CEOs 
on this what I call asset protection. How to, and part of that is how to be a better leader, how to be a better communicator as a leader, right? How do you anticipate high stake events, right? And so that, so what happened was is that at the beginning, at the end of 2012, I kind of, the, I had about five people then. I, it just ended up that I was left with about three people and I said I can either reboot and rebuild or I can, I can pivot over here to consultant. That's what I did. So in that, I worked with a mid-cap company that had 11 crises in 12 months. Oh, wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. And it was during Obamacare, so it was in the healthcare space. And so I realized, wow, well, we just, we're not, this is, this is crazy, right? And that was the time when I got recruited by Vistage. It took them six months for me to say yes. And so I said, with David Boyette, who was a best practice chair for Vistage, I had been introduced to in 2009. When I and was Vistage in, is, can you explain Vistage, yeah. People? So Vistage is the best practice uh, private peer advisory boards. We've been around since 1958. We're based in San Diego. We're about 21,000 CEOs, presidents, and owners that are members across the globe. And so, what size businesses? Are so they're middle America. So they're mid, uh, sorry, mid cap. So they're anywhere from a billion down to about five million for okay. CEO groups. And so our sweet spot is somewhere between about fifteen million and about two hundred fifty million. About so okay. it just depends. It's all really about the person and the leader. Sure. So um, anyway, so I was um, so I was asked. Uh, he said, "I think you. This is what you need to do." And I'm like, oh, "I do not." I was an awful social worker. I do not want to do this. Six months, I kept, so I said, okay, I'll come to training and see. Well, I went in January of 2014, and I said, oh my gosh, this is a, I'm already doing this. You know, I'm already doing this, and this is a chance for me to kind of be preventative, right? Right. To be able to get people around the table, to be able to see the runway of, oh, this could happen, right? If I don't do this, or if I ignore my problem or don't see my blind spots, or I'm not held accountable. So I started and so uh, in 14, so I now have three groups. So I have two CEO groups and I have one trusted advisor group. Um, my role is to put the right people around the room. I facilitate a full day session with the CEO group. So I program that with speakers, content, okay. exercises, and then we process issues and we have a proprietary way around getting clarity around issues. And okay. then I do executive coaching in between and then I have some private clients. And then I still do uh, a little bit of crisis asset protection as well. So, so what do you see today uh, as the biggest leadership issues that people focus. have? Focus, especially at this size, focus. Focus and clarity is that as a leader today, as a CEO, you have to know a lot of things and it's moving very quickly, right? And so being able to have the information that you need quickly to make a decision is one thing. That's the benefit of having any kind of group, whether sure. it's whatever, right? I think the other thing is really focus and really clarity is that, is that we, everybody gets so distracted into the day-to-day, -day, right? And so as a leader, you've got to get out. And you've got to be able to work on the business, not in the business. And that's really what I love about what well, we how do. Is, how does one do that if they're... Get you know get out of the business itself. Like, what is it that you'd have to put in place? So you or can, change your thinking. Yeah. So one of the things is that you probably have an annual or you do strategic planning with your team, right? And so sometimes that strategic planning, there are people that are assigned to different parts of that, right? So you can, and you, if you're real organized and disciplined, then maybe you remember we have to do this every month, right? So th that's what typically happens. But a lot of what happens too is that people do those plans and they, they get off. They just get so, it's so easy to go down this path to solve all these problems. So that's what any, any private peer advisory group, no matter whether it's Vistage or YPO or whatever all the brands are that we have, the goal is, is that the benefit is that you get out. So you're looking at issues, like what's the most important issue that you have to be solving? Are these like, are these, you know, like, big, you know, are they going to trample you kind of issues? Are they, you know, they're going to kind of slowly kind of just eat at you? And so you have to identify what those issues are. We have kind of a process that we use, and so I like that. It's kind of a process that I kind of use not knowing that it was a process, if you know what I mean, that yeah. fits into, right? So I think it's, and it's the deliberate doing it every single month. So it's once a month, taking a full day, you look at you know your plans, you look at what is kind of coming up based on the issues that are being processed and 
executive coaching, what are those things that you need to bring to the group to talk about? Because there's a, you get at the end of the year, look, we're at, we're, all, we're in the, we're almost past the, we're past the, in the second quarter, right? And so I'm asking everybody, what'd you do and how'd you do on your first quarter goals, right? Even if you have a board, if you're a CEO, it's still lonely at the top. Of to course. be able to have a group, to be able to come in and say, you know, you said you were going to do that. Legacy employees right now, right? This is a big challenge. So we we'll just kind of keep, keep all work, find a different place for them. Because people are going so fast, and these people that started with you, right, who they took a reduced salary, sometimes these are your mentors, yes. right? And how do you, what do you do with them? Well, if nobody's holding you accountable, then, then they're just over here, right? We we spent a lot of time. Was a and then tra- you have to transition of people that transition. people that start off the company are That's not right. necessarily the people they later don't have on. The skill set. The skill set because it's a jack of all trades versus specialization right. as you move on. So it's deliberate. So how you do it? It's a discipline. It's deliberate. How you go right. about it. Right. So you got to get out of the business and take a look okay. at it. Right. Um. And have other people help you see right. it from another perspective exactly. that are not inside the business as well. Right. Or they have a different. Like we do a financial review. Right. And so people may look at your finances and they might have a different perspective because they have different experience right, right? and they can help you see and they can help stuff. you see that so I think that's where and you know that was where the business consultant that I had always said you got to get out of the business you can't work in it you got to work on it so what, what advice would you have uh, for women because I think you know I, we have women that are watching the show and uh-huh. listening to it um, what career advice would you have for them in today's world uh, in order to be successful, mm-hmm. in order to find the things that they love, um, and just find maybe the balance that they need? Mm-hmm. I mean, what piece of advice would you have, or pieces? Because well, obviously you must be doing mentoring other women and right. helping them along as you're doing all this because you're part of a lot of different groups. Mm-hmm. So I think one misnomer is balance. I don't really think you get balance. I think you blend. Yes. It's different than balance. It is. It's different than balance. I've always said that. I think so. I think first you have to say, how am I going to blend? You know, it's not, we're not, you know, balance is we kind of segment things, right? And I think it's a wonderful challenge, but I think it also just pulls at people because they're always, I mean, most of the women that I work with have children. They're feeling, yeah, guilty. I see this with my daughter. I see this with my sisters who have children, you know, that you always, so you, how do you blend? It's really, we have a, whether we like it or not, technology has forced us to blend, right? That doesn't mean you're on your cell phone all the time. I have a, I have actually a, a one of my CEOs who, you know, it's a guy who goes home and he's like, he t- doesn't do anything. He doesn't do anything at night. He maybe go on his email late at night. He just separates that personal time. So how do you blend? That's one thing for women. I think the other thing is you've got to find your passion. You've got to find your passion. You've got to work at something that you really, that you really truly love because we're giving a lot of ourselves, right? We have two jobs. We get, we get a lot of ourselves during the day and we go and we have another job. So we, got to, we have to do something that we really love because that gives you energy. It gives you positive stress, right? I think the third thing from a career standpoint is, is that find opportunities to put yourself in situations that are different in terms of, you know, within a corporation. One of the big hot topics right now for women in leadership is paid board seats. And I just led a, a panel discussion on this for our Visage Women in Leadership Network. Uh, we have a conference, and I just did this in February, and I invited three very successful women, in, uh, one, two corporate and one entrepreneur, on how they found these paid board seats. And so one of the things that they talk about and one of the things that you'll see is that you just have to get different kinds of experience so you don't get... How would one get a paid... Uh, what, uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a campaign just like you find a job. It's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of work. You have to figure out, like, I mean, I can inter- I'd love to introduce you to Julie England. She has kind of a, a roadmap and kind of a class. Kellogg um, is getting ready to do their first um, course in November. Uh, uh, to help women get on paid boards, but this is a this is a hot topic, especially among corporate women and then women who are entrepreneurs who own companies who want women on their boards. So that's one of the the things. You know, there's um, Grant Thornton just came out with a study that showed only one in four managers are women. Right, 
And so the challenge is, is that we are making progress, but it's just like, I think if you use, I think being a woman is great, but it's, but you just have to be the still best that you can be. And you've got to probably work harder. That's just the way it is. That's the way it is. And there's a lot of women entrepreneurs. The Fortune just came out with, the, I think, the 50 yes. fastest. And so Orange Theory, you know, which is the, um, that, uh, she started that, like, she was in her 50s. She started that business, right? Um, uh, Pinnacle Technologies, which is Dallas Bates, uh, Nina, I forget her last name, but, you know, she started that company. You know, that's a huge, big technology, you know, company. And so I think that for women, that your confidence and, the, and that support system is really important. It's really, really important. What do important. you think that uh, men can, leaders can learn from women, lead, women well, leaders? I mean, I just well, feel that one, because one yeah. of the things that I find is on the whole topic Brene Brown brings up about vulnerability yes. Yes. and emotions. Love yes, exactly. Um, and so I'd love to get your thoughts on how men can take what women are doing and really implement mm -hmm. it to up their game. Because I think a lot of times men don't really think like that. They don't even think right. that they could leverage those skills and strengths. Right. I think the whole emotional intelligence and vulnerability is something that as men, and these are general terms. Yes. So I'm just saying this is general. This is not, we're not taught that. And I, it's interesting because I can see dynamics. I see this with my members. You know, I see it. So I have women in my groups right but when those women aren't there it's different because sometimes the women bring out the emotional side right the men are on the fact side they're on the fact side they're on the fact side and also when they have conflict that conflict only happens like in that meeting afterwards they're okay women hold on to that because it's their feelings and I find I've seen this happen in my vistage work where there was maybe one woman and now there's multiple women in a group of men and the dynamic totally changed. They're kinder, gentler, they're not as, you know, they're, they're, they're directness, they're direct, but they're a little bit more kinder because the women are kind of neutralizing some of that. But I think the whole emotional intelligence and being vulnerable is something that you, you're not taught. And men see vulnerability as, as weakness as, as the weakness, number one. That's right, that's exactly, the thing. yeah, exactly. So and what so, would you tell them, a, 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 man who's a leader, how uh, can you be more vulnerable in your position as being a leader? Like, what, what right. advice would you give someone if they just said that to you? So, um, it's interesting. So, I like to know what, when men have women in their lives, do they have daughters? Do they have nieces? You know, do they have, what is it, their relationship with their girlfriend or their wife, right? And so, I think that one thing is that you just have to, it's like this you know you have this chasm right and you just have to take one step one step one step one step sometimes you got to go back that's where i've done a lot of things right you got this chasm that you got to go through it seems mm -hmm. kind of scary right and you're probably going to feel trying to make yourself more vulnerable but the reality is is that it's going to feel really uncomfortable because you're not used to doing it so part of it is 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 going and just asking people like how are you like I really encourage one to ones. I was early on in my career uh, when I worked at uh, Federated. My the CEO and my CMO did one to ones. Okay, so that's one hour, full attention with me, working on the business, not in the business, and caring about me as a person. That was a great tool. I did it in my entire career, and I asked all my CEOs. What to questions do it. in those one on ones do so, you think are pivotal ones that a lot of people miss? or don't ask about? or It's not about checking the box, what are all the things that you have to do. Number one is, how are you? And being sincerely interested. I think sometimes you're not always interested in the people that work you work with. You just want them to get the job done. I, I've been guilty of that before, right? I think that's, we got a lot to do. First, you gotta be sincerely interested and then you gotta listen. You know, how are you? that I care about you, 
You know, that's a big thing. Now, why why do you think that that's, uh, I'm just curious from your yeah. perspective, so pivotal yeah. right. in building that relationship. Is it the fact that caring, and caring. when you care about other people, then they're going to care more about their job, and their investment? Yeah, in, in, exactly. And maybe they're isolated, or they don't even have people to talk to. That's true. I think that when you hear, I mean, I don't know if it's just a simple, It, it, it seems simple, but yeah. like the simplest things people miss, That's right? That's right. But I, mean, I just think if you care about other people, it's also like a two-way street. Yes. Right? And so if you're sincerely interested, that is one of, um, I'm always impressed with, you know, the leaders at Jackson Spaulding here in Dallas and also in Atlanta. They truly care about all their people. Always, they care, and that makes a difference. That caring, that means they're going to care about, you know, about the business. You care about them. So one thing is really, how are you? I remember that was one of the first things we'd be in the middle of doing all these things, and and Linda would say to me, like, how are you? How you doing? One of my very first CEO that I worked for, Jack Miller. He's a he was the CEO of Sanger Harris, which was the Federated Division here in Dallas. And he had the old walking around theory. And when I got divorced, he used to come in my office and just sit. And you just sit that down. That is something a lot of he people just, don't do. Well, plus we are global. So you can't, you know, you can't do that, right? But that's the beauty of having the business, you know, in one place. And he would just sit in my office and he would just sit and he said, really, how are you? I'm worried about you. I'm concerned about you. How are you? That was huge. Huge. I learned that. I learned that from him as well. So caring. Caring about, caring about your people. So in that one-to-one, -one, first is how are you as a person, right? How's it going? Right. And then what are the, what's the most important thing we should be talking about today? Like what are the three most important projects? Okay. So that's the other thing. What's the most important thing? So you think, what is the most important thing we should be talking about? So I think those are some of the critical things. Again, it's about focus and taking that day-to-day -day up to the next level. You know, what are the challenges that, you know, what, are the, what do you see in trying to get X, what are those biggest challenges, or what can I do to help remove some of those challenges? Because that is part of your role as a leader, is in removing some of those challenges or giving them the tools to do what they need to do. Talking about that, what is your stance on personal issues and you as a manager working with employee and helping them? Because I, I find in working with uh, executives that if they have significant personal problems, it impacts their performance at a massive level. And yeah. you can't really even get to the business mm -hmm. if you don't help them with the personal. But that's as an outside person. Yeah. But as an internal in a company, in most companies, I mean, that, does, that doesn't really happen as much. I don't really see that mm -hmm. people being proactive in people's mm -hmm. personal life and mm -hmm. helping them if it's in shambles, or in a problematic mm. way, how, how would you recommend that people uh, help people with that, or do you think they should, or should they intervene, should they not? So, um, I work a lot in, in the people, the CEOs that I work, we do personal and, and professional, it's just kind of both, because it all comes together, so we spend sometimes more time on the personal, because especially as a leader, that can get in the way. When I was on the corporate side, we had a corporate like psychologist, we could just go in there and talk to her. I thought that was amazing. This was like in the 80s when nobody was doing this, right? And so when you say that, I was like, well, of course we're, we, we help the people. So, I, so to me, it's like, yes, because what happens is, is that you have to figure out if, like you said, that personal is impacting their performance. You it's know, hard not to have, if you're having problems at home because it's a well, distraction. Well, exactly. But a lot of people will say, well, you know what? No, it doesn't. It's, it's no, no, no. It's, I, I can, you know. Compartmentalize. Some people do. And I, some people do. I think, yeah. I believe that some people can, but there's a point when that pain crosses over and there's right. a threshold that ultimately sort of like a dam right. breaks. Yeah. So, you know, we have a lot of labor laws, HR issues. I can't speak to that. I just think as a person that you care. It's a bottom right. line that, that you care and that you want to help that person, but that help person also has to help themselves. Yes. So in a corporation, what are you prepared to do to help that person? How valuable is that person to you, right? And so figure out, do they need outside counseling? You know, and when I do the coaching sometimes, when I'm working with people that are, you know, my CEOs that might have people, they might have issues that that's something we have to do. And they have to want to get those issues resolved as well. So it's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. So 
thank you for all this wonderful information oh, gosh, welcome. and know. advice and insights as we've been doing the show. So how can people find you, reach out to you, where can they go? Probably the best way is to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, so that's the best place to find me. And we'll, I'll have all that information. Yeah, so great. So it's can. on LinkedIn is to find me and I'd be happy to, you know, help them in any, any way that I can. So. Well, thanks again, and thanks all of you for joining in for another show of Executive Breakthroughs, and we will be back, back in next week with another fantastic show and another great guest, so make it a great day. Music